Welcome to DEF CON. How many first timers? Raise your hands. All right, good amount, good amount. So I guess everybody's here for the 10 a.m. old malware new tools on the Commodore 64. So we have Caesar here to our left. Welcome him. He's a first time speaker. So everybody knows what that means. Well, yes, it does. Well, good, good morning, and let's have Caesar kick it off. Thank you very much. Okay, good morning, everyone. Thank you for being here with me. And okay, let's start immediately. Speaking about those strange things for DEF CON, maybe something like coming from the past, but I think that it makes sense, uh, especially for this ER team. Let's speak ab about me uh, for a second, but just for a few slides, for, for one slide. My name is Cesare Pizzi. I work, my main job is a reverse engineer, so I spend most of, the, of my time looking at other codes, but sometimes uh, I also try to write something for the community, and uh, I like a lot, for example, to write software always about security regarding secu um, uh, regarding security tools like, for example, Volatility, Open Canary, Situs, uh, Speakeasy, and also have a couple of main projects running, uh, Sinwall and Resplit, which are entirely by, by, done by me. Uh, if you want to reach me out, you can obviously get, reach me on Twitter or on GitHub, open an issue, just uh, get in touch with me. I will be more than happy to uh, speak with you about everything about security. But okay, let's start with the why. It sounds pretty weird on 2022 to speak about Commodore 64 virus, viruses. Uh, and what made me decide to do this, did, uh, to do this was this picture coming from the DEF CON 30 team. Uh, I don't know, something went in my mind when I saw it. I saw it. Um, I decided to have, that I had to do something like uh, try to bring my knowledge that I have today back uh, with something that uh, I was using when I was a child, for example, but uh, be assured that this is not a talk uh, about, it's not a nostalgic talk, it's not something about, okay, the good old days, because that's not my way of approaching things. I'm, I want also to report another sentence that is coming from the DEF CON 30 team, and so that's exactly what this talk is about. So trying to move what was interesting in the past into the future. And so try to not to lose uh, what we lear learned in the past and, and, and try to keep it and make experience about it. So also doing this, I also realized that there were a lot more. Like for example, uh, I saw this kind of viruses uh, which was uh, really um, illuminating and uh, very, very interesting to do this kind of exercise. And remember that we are speaking about few hundreds bytes software. Everything written back then about viruses were more or less one kilobytes of software. This is particular that we are looking at today. It's in 700 bytes. And we will see that there will be a lot of things done in 700 bytes. Okay, let's uh, set some common historical background about Commodore 64 because maybe nobody, do, not, not all of you knows what we are speaking about. And okay, this is a picture of Commodore 64. In Italy, uh, where I come from, it was called the Big Biscuit because of the shape and the, the color of the chassis. I don't know if it's the same in other countries as well, but uh, that was the way. And it was one of the first home computers that uh, born in 1982 together with Apple II and a lot of others. It was mainly based for, used for gaming actually because of um, several reasons. But viruses were a thing back then. And uh, uh, so, they, they were existing, but it was very different from the current reality. Okay, let's start in def defining a virus before going ahead, just so that we are all on the same page. Okay, a virus, it's a, let's say, a kind of a program that uh, without user knowledge, try to persist and replicate. I'm sure that this is not a 100% uh, fitting uh, definition, but uh, it's a good starting point for all of us into going ahead and understanding what we are speaking about today. Okay, today we, if we think about virus or malicious software, we are thinking about something that is uh, built to give uh, a gain to the attacker. Mainly we are speaking about financial gain or gain of other type like, I don't know, information harvesting the, or something like that, but that in any case is going to a financial gain at the end. But uh, if we think about the situation back then, it was a completely different thing. 
because there were no financial uh, motivation behind the virus, but it was something more done for a show of technical knowledge, really, and not uh, doing something malicious to the user, but uh, pranking people, maybe, or just uh, uh, show something that is, uh, okay, I can do it, so I can show you that I can do it, but I don't want to harm you, or whatever, yes, or whatever else. And that's uh, the, the reason why I tend to define this more close to the demo scene back then. So the demo scene was the way of uh, showing the skills of a programmer doing graphic sounds and so on. And in some way, viruses were something like that, do, done for showing the uh, low-level technical expertise, let's say. And uh, you may think that the lack of financial uh, gain behind this may uh, go to some naive code, a few functionalities or something written very bad, badly. But it's not the case. We will see together that these tiny programs are really little jewels of programming and, uh, um, uh, tec and technical uh, skill set. Okay, let's uh, start from the state of the art. So which are the viruses known for Commodore 64? Uh, this is the list, pretty much complete. It's, it sounds pretty funny if you look at it because we have, uh, uh, we count seven entries here, which is more or less uh, what we can think it's, uh, it happens in a minute of malware uh, creation uh, nowadays. So uh, it's uh, really nice to see that there were so many, so, so few viruses back then. And uh, there are great analyses already done on most of them, uh, especially for BHP, which is the first one, and uh, considered to be the first viruses created for, virus for, created for Commodore 64 and one of the first virus ever created. But there is one which is uh, not analyzed yet. It, uh, the uh, Bula virus. Uh, the only thing, uh, it's, it was in, uh, in the list we saw before here, it was the fourth one. And uh, the only thing that I found uh, around before starting this kind of analysis was this little sentence coming from wiki.com uh, saying that uh, nothing was really known about this virus and there were some things happening when you run it, but it was not clear how it was replicating and so on. And so I decided to get this one in, end, in order to try to get, uh, get this back to life. I obviously used some tools and some uh, um, things to having it running again. And these tools, we are going to list them right now, are something to do static analysis, which is for example, the, the, the tool you, I use for static analysis is Ghidra, a well-known tool, I'm sure that you know it, with a specific plugin used to load the Commodore 64 virus. I did some custom scripting for, for analyzing the virus itself with uh, Java and the plugins uh, of uh, Ghidra itself. I also created a 010 editor custom template in order to be able to analyze the disk images. The 64 images are the files representing a disk in Commodore 64. Then I did, I do, I did also some um, um, dynamic analysis, obviously, and uh, obviously, and I used the Vice Simulator to, for doing that. Vice Simulator, it's an emulator which has also a very nice debugger in it, and then the Master 315, which is uh, which is an utility used to manage the 64 images again. Couple of screenshots about uh, about this, and this is, for example, the screenshot from Vice, which is the emulator I used for dynamic analysis. As you can see on the bottom, you see the Commodore 64 screen, and on the top you see the debugger. The debugger is uh, very well done. It allows you to step into the code, uh, dumping memory, dumping uh, uh, opcodes. And there is also this little uh, window on top of the right showing you register and uh, also these windows showing computer and drive 8. Remember this because it will be very important for our analysis. So it looks like we don't have a register just only on the, same, on the main CPU. And that's uh, important to remember for our analysis here. Then I use Ghidra, as I said, okay, this is a well-known tool, so it was for static analysis, it's assembler code, it, it supports uh, the Commodore 64 architecture, which is based on 6502 CPU. Uh, it also decompiled the code, but uh, in this case, it's not useful to have the code decompiled, to be honest, so I just look at the raw assembly code. Then here we have uh, uh, the custom template, a custom template I created for 010 editor, which allows me to uh, the inspect the content of a disk of Commodore 64. Uh, I'm going to release this uh, template, I already released it this morning, and I will give you some more details at the end of the presentation about it. 
Okay, let's now start in giving some details about our specimen, so our virus, it's, uh, the virus itself. Uh, the virus, from what we know, exists in two variants, which are identified by a version, which is 6.13 and 8.32, so we have also major release for that. And both of them are available to download if you want to, I don't know, have a look to them, to, to it, or replicate the analysis or doing something by yourself. You can download it from csdb.dk site. Okay, but before going into the details, we need to set some uh, common knowledge on Commodore 64 hardware because it's very important. You will see during the analysis that a lot of uh, characteristics of the Commodore 64 will be used in the code of the virus itself. And let's start from the main CPU. The main CPU of the Commodore 64 is, a, is the well known 6510 CPU, which is based on 6502 which was one of the first uh, very cheap CPU that uh, were produced uh, in early uh, 80s. And uh, probably it's the CPU that gave uh, the start to the uh, home computer movement. It's the CPU where used and um, on which it's ba are, were based most of the home computer back then, Apple II, uh, Atari, Commodore, and a lot of others. So, it was a very uh, cheap CPU doing a lot of things. In, ca in case of Commodore 64 one, we had a clock of 1 megahertz, 64K of RAM, and uh, 38 kilobytes of our program, for basic program. Commodore 64 had a characteristic, a special one, uh, had also some additional um, chipset for managing video and sound, and that's why it became very popular for gaming mainly. But the main CPU, it's the exactly the same as all the other home computer at the, at the, at the time. What it, it is interesting is that, and that I learned it doing this research, is that it's still used. Uh, you can actually buy one if you want from this site. The form factor is a bit different right now, as you can see, but uh, the 6502 and other variants of the CPU are still existing, uh, are still used as according to the site. And so that's why I'm saying you, you are not wasting your time this morning looking at this presentation because you are going to learn something very interesting like uh, uh, basics on uh, 6502 assembly uh, that we can use maybe on your next automotive project. I don't know if you want to use the 6502 CPU. And uh, okay, let's uh, spend a couple of words about mass storage. You see that picture of Commodore 64 before, which was that keyboard with some um, ports on that. Uh, it doesn't any kind of uh, uh, mass storage in it. So the mass storage back then was done with, in two ways mainly. The cheap one was a, a tape player which is awful, uh, slow, unreliable. Uh, it was really probably one of the worst piece of hardware ever created in uh, human uh, <laughs> history. Really it was, I remember it as a, unusable mostly. Uh, and it was a cheap solution, so that's what I bought for the first time. And then when you start to save some money, you can buy another piece of hardware, which is a bit better. It's not really a great uh, hardware as well, but it's a, a lot better than the tape, which was a disk drive uh, reading the floppy disk, the five inches floppy disk. You, I don't know if you ever saw it, the black one, the floppy one, exactly. And. Uh, why I'm mentioning this, uh, this hardware? Because it's a little, uh, little um, less known that uh, the 1541 uh, disk drive had exactly another 6502 CPU in it, a, a running uh, code, uh, having some memory, some, having some register. This is why I, let, I told you to have a look to the register window before on the uh, emulator um, debugger window, because actually you really have another CPU equal to the one installed on the main board. That means that you, in some way, you had a multiprocessor system back then in 1982, uh, because the two CPU can actually communicate between them, and they can transfer code between them and execute code at the same time. So it was pretty surprising to understand that uh, it, you actually had a multiprocessor system with uh, the main CPU and the one running on the drive. Uh, you can also offload some works on the CPU of the drive itself. Uh, it was not so easy because the connection between the two uh, systems was done through a serial bus, so it was, it was low and so on, but it was actually usable and it was used also by uh, legit software, let's say, uh, like Turbo Loader, which were programmed to load things and so on. 
And guess what? Yes, uh, this can be abused by viruses as well. And this is actually what the Bula virus is going to do. And we will see how uh, in a while. But before going into the details, we have, I, I promised you a crash course of assembly, um, of 6502 assembly. And so we will go very, very briefly. It's a crash course of two slides, so don't, don't be afraid about it. Um, Let's have a look uh, on uh, uh, how, it, uh, how it actually works. So we have a few registers in the CPU, uh, a lot less than what we expect from current architectures like the Intel one, let's say, where we have a lot of them. And we have basically a program counter, which is more or less the same as the uh, instruction AP of the Intel architecture, and is pointing to the current instruction of the, of the processor. And then three uh, general purpose registers. One is the A, which, is the, which stands for accumulator, and you can store values in it. And then X and Y, which are indexing registers. So these are three general purpose registers you can use in your programs. And that's all you, what you have. Uh, you have also some uh, stack pointer pointing to a fixed memory region going from 01000 to 01FF. And then a flag status which holds the results of comparisons, carry, and so on. So, very basic um, structure, very simple one, but uh, you can see that you can do a lot of things with this. Uh, I'm adding also these slides here regarding the register 00 and 01, which are reported by device simulator, because uh, these are out of our scope today. They are registered for the sound interface device, which was one of the, uh, the chip I mentioned before, doing for, uh, used for doing sounds. But we don't need them in our analysis today, just reporting this because of, for completeness. And so, uh, very basic uh, crash course about assembly. So we can basically do some things with the register. We can store values there and load values from the register themselves. So the instructions are pretty simple. It's a very, very simple instruction set on the 6502. And uh, you have LDA to load a value in the accumulator. So you can put a value there. You can put uh, an immediate value by putting a dash before it. Or, a refer or you can reference a, um, a memory address. And in the opposite way, you can also store the value that is in the accumulator into memory. So you have LDA and STA. At the same time, you have LDX, STX, and, LD, and STY and LDY for the same, for the same operation with other three registers. It's like the move operation in, uh, in Intel assembly, let's say. Then we have another uh, instruction, which is interesting for us, which is the JSR, which is the, basically the same as the call in the Intel architecture with the closer used by an RTS instruction, which is returning to the calling function. And then, obviously, we have also some branching instructions, so you can jump uh, around, uh, uh, basically, uh, on the results of several operations and so on. So you have this set of instructions here, BPL, BMI, BVC, and so on. Couple of slides, then we can jump into the virus itself. So uh, kernel, that strange word, it's coming from Commodore 64 era. Uh, what is kernel? It's like, it sounds like it's, it has been misspelled, and actually it was. It's something like probably it was meant to be kernel with the E, not the A. Uh, and this is the Commodore 64 ROM resident operating system call. So you can call some uh, routings doing basic operation by calling a specific uh, memory address. Compared to the modern, I put some quotes here, PC world, it's something like the BIOS uh, OS routing you have, we have in, uh, in current PC, more or less. So we have this way to call basic and low level kernel, uh, kernel calls. And then we have another way of calling uh, more higher level routings, which are the basic one, which are stored from A00 to BFFF. And this, this uh, memory area holds the code for the basic operation. So let's say if you want, I want to do a print, the code of the print is stored in this area and I call it directly by calling the memory area instead of writing print in my basic program. And that's a way of uh, doing things in Commodore 64. But uh, let's start now with our analysis. So the Bula virus, which is, uh, we, we saw before that it has been, it's one of the few viruses uh, remained which were not analyzed yet. Okay, we need to obviously start it in some way. Remember, okay, I said before, the, the virus never dies, so it's just a matter of giving him the right environment and it starts again. And the right, envi right environment in our case is the uh, emulator, obviously. And this is what happens when you start the virus. Uh, something strange, actually. So you, have this, you see this uh, flashing screen here and some gibberish printed out on the screen. 
which is, and then nothing happens. So uh, looks like um, really nothing has been done uh, to the user. But what happened behind the scene in this case? So let's start with the some code snippets. Okay, this is written really um, tiny here, but no, don't worry, I will go into the details now. Uh, and so we will see uh, with more details. So what happens during this command, so running the program virus, is that the, um, a serial bus was, was opened on the, the device. So remember that I spoke that the two processors between CPU, the main CPU, and the one on the disk drive communicate between a serial bus. So this serial bus has been opened. There was an execution of a command. And then there was this flashing screen, and then of course, the bus has been closed. So let's see what really happened here. These are the set of instructions opening the serial bus. As you can see, there are a JSR and a jump instruction point to the kernel. Do you remember the, the addresses beginning with FF? So these jump and JSR are pointing to two kernel calls, which are the calls actually used to open the bus, the serial bus, to communicate with the um, CPU of this 1541. And then there is the execution of a command. The execution of a command is simply sending a couple of uh, characters, three characters in this case, m-w, which stands for memory write. And uh, sending these commands, uh, these characters, these ASCII characters, or pet ASCII in this case, because uh, uh, Common64 had a uh, custom ASCII code. Uh, sending this and uh, some codes, what happened is that some codes from the main CPU is transferred to the memory of the disk drive in this case. So what the virus is, done, is doing like, uh, right now is just getting its code and transferring it on the uh, CPU drive. Yep. Then there is the flashing screen and the closing. Why the flashing screen? Um, back then, uh, IO operations were really slow, and you were sometimes really looking at the screen, trying to understand if something was happening or not. Uh, and the flashing screen was a way, a trick, used to let the user know that something was happening during the IO operation. So that's why uh, it, it has been added probably in this case, so just to let the user know that something was happening. And then, okay, the, the serial bus is just closed. So at this point, what has been done is that the virus code has been transferred on the CPU of the floppy, but uh, nothing else. So the code is, has not been executed yet. Why this has been done? For two reasons, maybe. Because in this way, it's stealthier, obviously, because the, the virus doesn't reside anymore on the main memory. And uh, it's, more, um, uh, it's more persistent right now, because even if you power off or reset the Commodore 64, actually, until you don't power off the drive, the virus still resides there, and it's not going away. So. That's a neat way to gain persistence on the, uh, on the call itself. Yep. And so, now the virus is on this drive memory. Uh, okay, it's time to execute it. Just to execute it, it's just a matter of sending another command, like the MW we saw before. Uh, the command is U3. It's another command coming from the, uh, the ROM of the 1541, uh, which exactly just, it just uh, start codes uh, at a very specific address, which is 0500 on the disk drive. Since the set of instruction we saw before was transferring code to that address, the U3 commands is just uh, executing code residing there. So what happens here, again, snippets, and uh, we are going into the details, is that the serial bus is open again. There is a U3 command sent on the serial bus. And that means that uh, the, the code starts. So the virus itself is starting on the, on the disk drive memory. Uh, there was a set of commands, U3 from U9, executing uh, code at different addresses from 0500 to FF01. It was just a matter of what you want to do and, uh, and execute in this case. And what happens meanwhile on the 1541, obviously there is some code uh, landing at uh, 0500 where, it, where you have the code uh, waiting for something. And there is just this tiny loop here, uh, which is just waiting for something. It's waiting for a, an attention signal to be coming low. Uh, that means that it's waiting for disk activity. So the virus has transferred the code on the drive, and that it's just waiting for something to happen. So, uh, if the user accesses the file, or save a file, or open one, uh, or whatever. Again, we need to set some other uh, knowledge about uh, the 1541 disk drive structure and layout before going ahead so that you will get the entire 
virus life cycle. Um, okay, disks were split in tracks as today, more or less. So no difference in, in, with this. Floppy disks had uh, 35 tracks uh, in, in them with different number of sectors for each track. Obviously, the smaller tracks, so the internal one, were uh, smaller, and so they had uh, fewer sectors than the external one with fewer um, storage capacity, obviously. Uh, one interesting track is track 18. Track 18, it's a special track in, special track in, uh, in the 1541 because it holds uh, the information about the disk and which files are on the disk. So R, uh, it's the track holding the directory. It's like the NF MFT and bitmap in NTFS, more or less. So uh, holding all the information about the disk. And uh, the special track 18, which is also 12 in hexadecimal, uh, as a special um, um, structure as well. Sectors 1 to 18 of the directory track contain the directory entries. So all the files stored on the disk are listed in these um, sectors. And there is a special sector, the sector 0, the first one, the very first one, which is the BAM, the block availability map, which holds the information about the free and used blocks on the disk, disk, disk itself which is very important because we will see that the viruses will use this information. Uh, this is the structure of the sector zero, the BAM. Okay, you see the first two bytes, which are holding, okay, some data that are, we are not interested in, uh, in, it, in them right now, so some generic data, but what is interesting for us, it's the byte four, which holds the number of free sectors of track one, and then the subsequent um, three bytes holding the bitmap of three sectors on the first track. And then this structure is repeated again and again and again for all the tracks of the disk. So you have the, uh, at byte eight, the number of free tracks for sector two, and then the bitmap of sector two, the bitmap is just a set of one or zero saying which blocks are used and which aren't. Then all the other, so and this is for track, uh, for the sector zero of track 18. Then you have sectors one to 18. Sectors 1 to 18 are holding the uh, files. Uh, there, are, there is uh, this kind of structure repeated for each file and uh, with this uh, specific structure here. You see that the first two bytes are pointed to the next one. So uh, when the two first two bytes are zero, this, is, this means that this is the last file used by the disk itself. Then you have very important for our, our analysis, it's the byte starting from zero to, so the third byte and the fourth and, fi and fifth, fifth byte. Because they are holding the file type, which could be PRG, SEC, real, or USR, and uh, the track and sector number of the first block of the file. Remember this because uh, we will see that uh, it will be used by virus itself. Then there are some other information, like obviously the file name, file size, and so on. This structure is repeated for every single file into the uh, Commodore 64 uh, of the uh, list of files. I, saw you, I told you that there are different file types in Commodore 64. Uh, these are the known ones, so PRG, SEC, RHEL, USR, and DEL. PRG is what is interesting for us. PRG is the executable files. Uh, it's like uh, the executable in the modern PC, so it's, it holds code that can be loaded into memory. And uh, the first two bytes of uh, the file itself are the address where the uh, program itself has, must be loaded. Um, this is what it actually executes code. Then we have also other type of files which are less interesting for our analysis, but let's just have a quick look to them. Uh, we have uh, sequential, which are just byte streams, uh, byte streams, yeah, so, um, sorry, uh, a way to access files to, um, without a random positioning. Uh, a rel one, which is uh, a similar way to access files, but with actually the possibility to position the, 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 um, the pointer in the file itself. Then USR, which is a user-defined one, and, uh, okay, that one, which is undocument, undocumented one. Uh, Common 64 also had a basic integrity file system, and so you had to close the file before uh, removing the disk, and you had also the possibility to have a star before the, the type of the file if the file has not been closed in the proper way. Now, okay, we set this knowledge, we know now that which are the information we, we need to, to understand what happens now, and let's start uh, to see what happens when uh, we try to infect, the, the program starts to infect the uh, program itself. So 
We, re we left the program waiting for disk activity, do you remember? Uh, when disk activity is recognized, okay, there is a start of a specific function, which is the 600, 600, 600. This function, uh, in, which is residing on the 1541, uh, do a very specific thing. So, um, it starts uh, to find the first free block where on track 18, so on track 12 in hexadecimal. So, that means the virus is not trying to store itself in a file. It tries, it's trying to store itself in the directory structure, which is something that is, should not be done because the directory structure just holds file, inf file information, not the file itself. And so it starts counting from the very end of the, um, the, 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 the track itself and try to find free blocks there. Okay, this is just the, the way of, uh, of doing that, it's looping from in the, in the BAM, so it loads the, uh, the BAM, you see the block zero here, and then starts looping and looking for free sectors at the end of the file. Why it starts from the end of the track 18? Because it's more likely to have them free. Uh, Commodore 64 disks were not known to be, to hold uh, hundreds of files. Probably most of them uh, had, uh, I don't know, 10, 20 files. And so, usually the last three blocks of the track 18 were actually not used at all. And so it's very likely to have them free. And so the virus is trying just to check if uh, these three blocks are free, actually. And if not, it just try to move it and look for the one going through the uh, beginning of the file. And it does it uh, through this loop here. When it detects three sectors, why three? Because the, actually the code of the virus itself, it's all, it has been all in three sectors it marked them as used into the bitmap. So it does not write the code uh, again uh, still, but uh, it just mark it, mark the sector as used. Okay, now uh, it's, uh, the, the virus itself just found a way to, okay, it can store its code on the disk, but it's not sure yet if uh, it can be re-executed because uh, actually the virus itself wants to be re-executed in order to infect another system, another disk. And so it starts another loop looking for a PRG file. We said before that PRG files were the executable one, and so it starts a loop to uh, look for this kind of file. You can see here that it loads the first uh, sector and then tries to compare, for example, you see that it's comparing the, um, at, the, at the very end of the, um, I don't know if I can point it, yeah. There, it, point, it compared the file type and it looks for the PRG one. When it found it, it starts uh, the real infection phase. Until then, it doesn't. So what happens is that, okay, I found a PRG file but there, and so I want to uh, start the infection process. Uh, what does the infection process? It just gets the very first pointer of the, of the program, of the PRG file, and it makes it pointing to the track 18. So, Usually, probably, the pointer of the file is just pointing to another track, not the track 18, because track 18 is not meant to be to holding some codes. And so it just moves this pointer to the track itself. And in this way, it just basically try to get be, try to be re-executed when uh, the, the, the user just load the file. Uh, there is an additional check, so the, 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 the virus also check if the file is, uh, is already infected. So if it finds that the PRG file is pointing already to track 18, which is basically impossible in a normal situation, it just skip the file and okay, it says, okay, probably it's already infected. So you can see that there, is, there are also error checkings and so nothing is left to uh, the, um, with, uh, to random things and, and so it's, really something that is uh, well done in this case. So it's now time to infect the file. Um, you, the virus itself, it's just getting the track number for the file itself. It's replacing the track and sector number, obviously. It replaced the values with the uh, track and sector. Track will be 18 for sure. Sector will be the sector where it saved the three blocks. It replaced them so that the PRG file uh, will point to that. And then it also makes the very last block of the, um, of the virus itself pointing back again to the PRG file so that the execution of the PRG is kept. 
uh, and the user maybe it does not realize that there was an infection. This is not, this is not really working every time, but uh, it actually worked. So let's recap what actually the infection process is. So we had, as you remember, the uh, on disk activity, the loop waiting for on disk activity, then, okay, uh, when there is a disk activity, track it in uh, has three free blocks, yes. If yes, it starts the infection process. If not, just exit. If the PRG file, uh, then if the three blocks are free and a PRG file is found, it starts the infection process. If the PRG file is not found, uh, it does something like, a, let's say, plan B. Uh, it just renames the disk to Bula rules and it exits because, uh, okay, it just not trying to do something harmful or doing something bad to the, the system itself, but just exit, just renaming the, the, the disk itself with uh, a, new, a new name. Okay, I promised you that we were going through, through, through the two versions of the virus. Basically, the two versions were, were very similar. I don't know why there were two major releases between them, but uh, okay, the two versions are very similar. The only difference between the two are the, um, okay, the loading of the version 8, it's a bit sturdier, so we don't, you don't have the, the flashing screen. And it also hooks the save command. So um, hooking in Commodore 64 was pretty trivial, trivial, trivial to obtain uh, because uh, addresses for the routings are saved on uh, 03002030 FF. So it's just a matter of replacing that addresses uh, with uh, a new one to redirect a command. In this case, uh, the version 8 is replacing the save vector with a reset vector so that if the user is typing save to save something, it just got the computer itself reset and then so everything is cleaned up, but you still have at this point the virus is residing on the, vi on the code of the, sorry, on the CPU of the 1541 um, uh, device. Okay. I published some tools because uh, this exercise was done uh, through several tools, but I also um, built my own tools for doing this analysis. I hope maybe you can find them useful also to do some other analysis about virus malware or maybe just other programs. Um, this is the 010 template editor, uh, editor template, which has been built to read and analyze the disk structure. As you can see, you can analyze uh, on the bottom side here uh, the structure, for example, of the BAM, of the directory, uh, showing up uh, which is the bitmap of each block, uh, and so on. So it helped me to analyze what the virus was doing, and uh, it's pretty neat to use for analyzing disks images of the Commodore 64 uh, itself. Then I created a couple of Ghidra scripts in order to mapping the code. Uh, as I said, you the um, Analyzer was the, the, the Gita analyzer, uh, was also the compiling, but I mostly used assembly in this case. And these scripts are just mapping, for example, all the kernel and ROM calls for Commodore 64 into the, in the source um, of the assembly code, just uh, adding comments on what the call is doing. So it allows you to streamline your analysis of the code if you apply these kind of scripts on your analysis, for example. And the same has been done for the 1541 ROM calls because 1541 had its additional ROM calls, uh, the MW command we saw, the U3 command we saw, and so on. I'm also published the, the two databases of the Gidra database I created. Uh, these are two databases. It's, everything is heavily commented, as you can see here. These are the complete analysis of the two virus sample. Uh, you can open it uh, with your Ghidra and uh, have a look to it uh, if you want. Uh, they are, uh, uh, will be available on, on the GitHub as well. So mm, just uh, for reference if you want to have a look. And let's jump to the conclusion. So why uh, I decided to do the, 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 this talk today with you. Uh, okay, we are at the end and we saw that a fully functional malicious code can be put in 700 bytes. We saw that this, is, this was a virus that was completely functional with a lot of functions with uh, everything done in the proper way, replication, persistence, even, even some really nice things like uh, moving itself on different devices and so on. So the techniques used by the virus were not new because they were used by legit software as well. So um, they, were, they were not discovered by these viruses for sure, but it was in any case interesting to 
complete this analysis because uh, it was really helpful for me as, as a reverse engineer. And uh, I, I'll, I'll tell you also why. Okay, all the, as I said, the scripting together with the fully commented commit GitHub database are available on my GitHub, and uh, you can download them and uh, have a look if you want. And let's have a look on what we learned, or what I learned, and I hope you learned as well, because that's the real core of the talk, from my point of view. Uh, I'm a, as I said, I'm a reverse engineer. And um, from a reverse engineering point of view, what I learned, or let's say recalled, because sometimes it's just a matter of recalling things, not really learning, but sometimes you tend to forget some things. Uh, with this analysis that, okay, for example, few assembly instructions does not mean that we have few functionalities. We saw 700 bytes software doing a lot of things, uh, like replicating, writing, checking for errors, which is not really something that you can give for, uh, for done, even if higher level programs. So uh, that's something that you have to consider. And that's uh, really interesting for, for us as reverse engineering. So uh, it does not mean that a small program is doing few things. Uh, then the other important things that I'm sure I tend to forget and think it's a gray area in the malware analysis nowadays, it's that, it's that we don't have to forget external devices when we are looking at malicious software. Um, in this case, we saw that we had two CPUs running on two different uh, devices of the computer itself. Right now, think about uh, how many chips you have in a, a, a modern computer. Uh, I'm sure that you can tell me that, okay, but these are not executing code or you cannot access directly. Yeah, true, but uh, you have device drivers accessing these kind of things. And uh, think about it. Think about the thing that uh, you may misuse a device driver in order to, I don't know, execute code, write code, store code somewhere where we are not expected, we, not, we don't expect to see it. We have a lot of additional things in our systems right now. And so far, from what I think is the, this is a kind of a gray area. It's not really explored uh, from what regards the, um, the malicious software. And so something we, we need to take into consideration. Uh, and then the third thing I learned, and I would like to also to pass to you, it's the, that the assembly proficiency opens a lot of doors. Um, I tend to see that assembly is a bit, let's say, a forgot language. So it's not teached anymore. Nobody mm, is caring about it. Uh, I don't, I'm not saying here that you have to write your next word processor in assembly, which is not the case, obviously. And probably you don't need to write anything in assembly in most of the case. But it's very important from my point of view that everybody working in security knows assembly and knows in a proper way because this really opens a lot of doors. Uh, from my point of view, for example, in this kind of analysis, uh, I didn't know the 6502 architecture. I learned in doing this analysis together with you uh, this morning. And the fact that I had knowledge of Intel assembly or ARM assembly uh, really streamlined for me the analysis of this simple architecture. So that's something that we need to keep uh, into consideration also when we think about uh, studies of uh, new people coming into security fields and so on. We don't have to forget that the assembly language is very important for our purposes. And uh, okay, so these are all the references for what I used and what I was uh, speaking about today. Uh, I want to leave these slides some seconds so that everybody is credited as, uh, in the proper way. And um, okay, so I think that I'm at the end of my presentation. So I just want to say thank you to everyone here and for staying with me for the entire presentation. And uh, if any question, maybe we have still have some minutes. I don't know, five minutes. I don't know if you have if any of you have a question or something. Okay. Sorry. I'm not sure if you uh, say the, the removal of the hook itself. Eh? The removal process is just uh, done by the reset itself. So when you reset the memory, 
everything is uh, brought back to the original state. So the save is just uh, replaced with the correct uh, address. So when you type save and you replace the vector, the Commodore 64 has been reset, but everything then it's uh, bring back to the original state. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think so. Let's say that, uh, okay, it's not just a matter of, of this CPU, obviously, but uh, okay, this is obviously a CPU that is still used, so you can apply the same concept that we saw today. Probably not all these concepts, because some of the concepts we saw together were really um, specific to Commodore 64 architecture. But uh, all the rest of the things, uh, like the assembly code and so on, it's exactly the same. Yeah, 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 that's exactly the same. Yeah. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you, really.